It's difficult to work out exactly what the theft of cables is costing us in hard cash, lost business and ongoing inconvenience. And whether it's power cables out in the bush or phone lines in a new housing development, it's not always easy to catch the culprits. But here's the good news, and it comes in the form of a team called the Copperheads. It's 11 p.m. in Maddenburg, Cape Town. The substation is burnt out because the copper fittings were stolen. The community is furious because they were plunged into darkness and their TVs and fridges blew because of the power surges. They know who's responsible. Our children, no, no one else, our children that's involved. And we have to stop it. They've taken two brass nipples and brass cap. The worth of that, 45 rand at any scrapyard, to replace the unit, one and a half million. So there's absolutely nothing petty about copper theft. And around the country, it costs about 500 million rand to replace the stolen infrastructure. But now think about the losses incurred because of this theft. And you're looking at about two and a half billion rand or even more. Well, the city lost um, in the last financial year 22 million. Um, it's not only costing the city money, it's costing ESCOM and Telcom a lot of money. And um, if it continues the way it uh, was going to continue, it would make this um, load shedding look like a baby. City councillor Peter van Dalen is so angry about the scale of the copper and non-ferrous metal theft that every night he patrols his ward to try and catch the thieves red-handed. I go out every night, usually about one o'clock and then I drive around till about four o'clock. And um, that is my patrolling time. This is the time when they steal. This is the most likely time that you would catch something. We've worked that out already. He helped establish the city of Cape Town's uh, so specialist the copper right. theft unit, the Copperheads. We're here at the Copperheads headquarters in Paro, about to head out on a couple of raids on uh, scrap yards and uh, bucket shops in the area. Information's come in from the community that they are trading illegally, basically buying stolen property like this. Since 2006, there's been a huge increase in copper theft in the Western Cape. The syndicates moved into the Cape from up north, along with a dramatic increase in the copper price and a chronic rise in tick abuse. Anything, drain covers, taps, water meters, street lamps, telecom lines, and most of all, copper cables are stolen. The city of Cape Town may be committed to the delivery of housing. The services are provided, the electricity and phone lines are installed, but this is harvest time for the cable thieves, and of course, the whole process gets delayed. This cable's here every week, we must come and replace it, every week. The first prize is to strip the plastic coating to get what is called shiny bright. But if that's not possible, then the cables are burnt to remove anything that could positively identify them. Then it's off to the nearest small-scale scrap dealer called a bucket shop, which head of the copper theft unit, Arthur October, says they're often open 24-7. Now, one must remember that the bucket shop is the first step to the scrap yard. Um, this is also a, a, a huge problem in the community as the, the drug addicts, they steal anything of value and sell it to these people. I call them ATMs because if somebody needs some money, they just steal something here and they would go and get their money from the scrap dealer. Copper theft is not limited to the small-time drug addicts. There are major syndicates operating throughout the country. Last year, cable thieves stole more than one and a half kilometers of a high voltage cable, about that thick, which ran along this trench and was meant for a nearby development. They actually dug it out of the ground and uh, Renz Binnemann, an expert on copper theft, got involved in a cat and mouse operation to catch the culprits. But I mean, this is like a guerrilla base, eh? In the previous years, what happened was that the syndicates, um, which mostly operate from the Gauteng area, 
um, would send uh, a group of people out to an area like the Western Cape. They would infiltrate the area. They would then plan operations together and hit a specific target. Since 2006, we found the change in the murders of Randy. They would train up specialists in the, in the Gauteng area, send them down to the area, and they would get people from the local environment. Like in this environment, it was the woodchoppers and the, the people that is staying in the bush that was used to do the digging. Catching the thieves is very tricky, so the copperheads focus on getting the scrapyards to police themselves. So you have to tell them to know that you have a copy of the ID, you have a full address. You have to tell them to know that if you have the goods that you have here, you have to buy them, but you have the information that you have there over in script. You have to do nothing from this. So the books is what they know is is next second. Scrap dealer Ernie Pierce has been arrested before, and he says it's hard to tell the difference. But sometimes you must just look at the stuff and know it's stolen, eh? How can you tell us that? You ask the man where he get it from, he's an electrician. How she work on a council? He says no. So what must you do? I guess the only way is not to buy any copper cables. I can, I, I, I can do without it. But the next man is going to buy You're not going to stop it. That I promise you. Here we've got, what, uh, copper pipe. Who in his right mind would sell brand new copper pipes like this? I mean, anybody can use it. I mean, you can even use short pieces like this when you do your house. Um, so work. you're saying that uh, the scrap merchants should recognize this as stolen? Of course, it's obvious. Stolen, eh? It's obvious. A whole bag full of this stuff. I mean, it's definitely not off cut And it's not scrap. 64 kilos of cabling um, is 3,050 rand for this bag. I mean, this was a very serious question. Rudy Erasmus is one of the Copperhead's success stories. Initially, he resented the new regulations, but his company now cooperates with the unit and actually tips them off. So why are scrap dealers uh, accepting the, these materials? It is an easy way out for them to make a quick buck. They tell the people, we'll take the stuff from you, we'll pay you a bit less, because you know it's stolen and I know it's stolen. Janine Meiberg, chair of the Western Cape branch of the Chamber of Commerce South Africa, says that the second-hand goods bill of 1955 is toothless. They get fined, but the profit that is made out of the sale of stolen copper, copper alloy, is nothing in comparison to the payment of the fine. So they gladly pay the fine and then just carry on. The new bill has been before Parliament for the last four years, and there's talk that it may be passed this year. How would uh, the new legislation help you? Well, the new legislation puts the onus on the owner to regulate the business. I think that the uh, stringent punishments will be a bigger deterrent, but it will really give us more teeth as well to clamp down on this illegal trade. But despite the lack of legislation, the Copperheads have had more impact than local government units in the rest of the country. The Copperheads has done very, very well. The reason is that um, it's a close unit that was formed according to uh, information. It consists of three uh, legs. It's one is the consulting part of giving the information intelligence. Second part is getting investigators in place who can do the investigations. The third one is reaction members that can go out and do the reaction immediately after it's happened. So putting the three together into one basket is very much easier than having one party from a parastate, another one from the police, and another one from another department trying to do the same thing. They attribute their success to the information they get from the public via their toll-free number. The Copperheads have arrested 95 people in the past six months. And there are now 58 cases before the courts with six people convicted in the last month, all being sentenced to between one and four years in jail. Many of those arrested were employed by the council. But the police often don't respond to copper theft call-outs, and with a national conviction rate of just 6%, many of the cases are simply dismissed as minor misdemeanors. Clearly, the legal system and the police need to be much better educated as to the severity and impact of these crimes. In the last financial year, it was almost half a billion rand that was exported from the Western Cape, and that in spite of the fact that we don't have any copper mines in the Western Cape, and that 98% of that figure is scrap waste of copper or copper alloy. And then, which is even worse, is in between the period of 2005 and 2006, there was an increase in the copper export of almost 75%. The lack of non-ferrous metals generated from this scrap is putting South African companies out of business. John Reed makes motor car engine components. 
He's been fighting for the last 20 years to get the government to impose export duties on non-ferrous metals. Well, it's tough. We have to bid against the entire world for aluminium and copper, which is supplied you know, onto the local market. Something in the region of 40, 45,000 tonnes of aluminium leaves the country every year. Copper is probably three times that amount. If that was depressed and it traded at, for example, 40 rand, and 20 rand went into the, uh, the government coffers, they would have a, uh, at least an account which they could use to develop business and, in fact, compensate uh, local government for the theft of copper. Well, this would be a good thing, because the same substation and two others in the area were hit a week after we filmed the first theft, and another 2.5 million rand of taxpayers' money was spent. And uh, a disappointing sequel to the story. The Copperheads have just found out that uh, Rudy Erasmus and the guys who were doing it right actually bought two stolen bronze statues erected by the council just for their scrap value. And Telcom have just released figures showing that they have lost 863 million rand to copper theft over the past nine months. Now that is huge. After the break, we meet up with Sia, off to study in the States, thanks to his hobby of building record-breaking rockets.